Keller is a big guy, big in spirit, big guy, big voice, big personality, somebody I've gotten to know just over the past couple of years and really like. And speaking of video installations, that's kind of your thing, isn't it? New uh, media. Me new media and video installations and video uh, uh, displays. And uh, yeah, I, Sam, I, I'm having a hard time describing what anybody does tonight. But this is Netman Sam. Sam Sunshine Levy. Uh -huh. This is his first time in life. Are you going to stand or sit? Sit. Okay. It is hard to describe that. Better than old media. Close to the mic, Jim. Yeah. Ten dollars. <laughs> Hi. Um, you know, like Barbara Z here, I'm a foodie and uh, uh, have more than a passing interest in wine and all things that are, you know, good and gastronomic and fun. And I thought I'd buck the trend this evening and rather than relating a personal anecdote story, um, I wanted to let you know about a little known um, but fascinating and true, of course, uh, factoid about New Mexico that almost nobody knows about. Uh, because other people have stolen the limelight from this, but wonderful. Um, and I, I chose this as one of my favorite stories about New Mexico, because Santa Fe is approaching its, depending on who you ask, uh, 400th anniversary, uh, 400 years ago, Don Juan de Onate, uh, and the Camino Real terminated here, and um, we're celebrating that, and closer to the mic, Jim. We're celebrating that in uh, 2010, or uh, like I said, depending on who you ask, uh, maybe 2004 or 2006, Albuquerque just had its 300th anniversary. Um, so in that spirit, this is something of, of cultural heritage and uh, culinary anthropology, Barbara, which is great to study through food, people and their food. Uh, about 220 years ago, this area was occupied uh, from a settler standpoint, primarily with Spanish missionaries, Franciscan priests, who had come and developed their mission. They were spreading the religion throughout. And uh, the seat of the government in the area was further south in the state. This was the end of the Camino Real and, and a trading point for Santa Fe. But the missionaries came through Texas and came up along the Rio Grande. Along the way, uh, to support the missions that they had to establish, they collected indigenous fruits and vegetables from North America, um, and being missionaries and priests, they needed their wine, of course. And um, going back just a second, the, the reason that I came across this is when I moved to New Mexico 25 years ago, I moved to Las Cruces in 1982, and uh, I worked uh, I was uh, in a Boy Scout troop, actually, and did some work on the side helping the, the priests at Our Lady of Guadalupe Church in Las Cruces, which was one of these missions. And uh, working with the priests and uncovering documents and just dealing with the stuff, moving stuff aside, move that, move this pile, get that ready. You realize, maybe you all know this, but churches have more than a few secrets, and they have a lot of things that they preserve for posterity we came across some interesting stuff that later I would pick up as a foodie and go and research and discover this with my connections to Southern Lion Spirits here. Um, so back to the, the mission, the, the missions that were established, Paso del Norte, uh, which is Juarez, uh, El Paso, that area, was the original seat of the government in the late 1700s. In uh, 1800, that seat of the, the tribal governments changed to Las Cruces to St. Genevieve's Church and the mission there, uh, and that would later go on to be the Our Lady of Guadalupe, where these records ended up. Um, and those three missions worked together to do a lot of different things and to be really the center of trade for northern Mexico, and um, they also were developing, you know, among other things that they were doing, they were developing these indigenous fruits, and one of the things was a grape varietal that they were using to create the wines that they were using. And they are there are records that we came across that show that in 1810 was the first time that they gave this grape varietal uh, the actual name that it still has today, uh, which is fascinating. Um, this name is still in use and hasn't been changed. 
in the 1820s, um, this varietal had become popular and had um, propagated not just around the area and in the Wild West, which it still was, but there were records of traders of nurseries in New York actually selling clippings of this grapevine, but it was an indigenous to North America. It had come from the Rio Grande Valley. Um, then things started to change a little bit. 1821 was the Mexican uh, independence, and the missions were reclassified. Um, and, and it was no longer under the, the Spanish domain. Missionaries had problems with the Indians. Uh, they began to revolt, to raid the missions. And they, they really weren't able to stay here much longer. New Mexico at the time had uh, like 30,000 settlers that were Spanish settlers uh, in these missions, which was 10 times as many as were in California at the time. But the writing was on the wall. It was time for them to head west. And so they, they went on and they moved on and to do their missions in California and deal with the, with the push to go westward. In the 1840s, this varietal then, the records show um, that this varietal started appearing in California at the Santa Barbara mission and points northward from there. And wine growers started picking this up and started using it in their blends in the 1840s. And I don't know if you know that much about wine, but the first California wine boom was in the 1870s when it really exploded. Napa and Sonoma, all that started in earnest in the 1870s. And a couple adventurous people, wine growers, um, gave this varietal a chance and started bottling it. It was very delicate had thin skin, um, it was touchy. It, it, it had, they had a bit of a problem keeping it in line. Um, another century goes by and technology and agriculture develops and uh, this varietal, now they figured out ways that they can control it, they can harvest it sooner and later and, and this, with a single varietal, they can create light, medium and, and full bodied wines. And um, more adventurous vintners in the 1970s, the second California wine revolution, start giving this varietal its own due, its own bottling. They start going single varietal bottlings of this, and it begins to get a name for itself. Well, this is not a California wine. This is a New Mexico grape that has been transported to California. And in the 1980s, the varietal was then um, grafted and crossbred and was given other lent its name to other grape varieties that also had the same name uh, or derivative names of it, became very famous. And this, this wine now is very big. It accounts for 25% of all plantings of grapes in this country. It started right here in southern New Mexico. It's known as the American Wine and Vine, uh, also known as the Amer American Heritage Grape. And uh, I, ju I just wanted to relate, very few people know that this grape that was discovered, first grown, named, cultivated, and very first turned into wine for 50, 100 years before it was anywhere else, came from New Mexico. It was a true New Mexico native son. And we've just lost it to the California market, which have let everybody think that it's theirs, but it's not. It's from here. The name of this native son, you might have heard of it, is Zinfandel. Thank <laughs> you.